Welcome to Rising Christian Bible Study. Our topic, Promises Based on Righteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Promises Based on Righteousness. I believe the Holy Spirit first gave me this, and I alluded to it in the last Bible study that there are truths that have come into existence because we are righteous. And it's important for us to focus on those truths. Remember what Jesus said. He said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. According to your faith, be it done unto you. So what you believe how you believe, how, how much you believe has a great effect on how you live out this wonderful journey called Christianity. This amazing uh, family walk with God. So the fact that you are righteous, there's certain truths that come into your life. But once again, what do you believe? Now, typically, righteousness, we know, is just being right with God and right standing with God. I looked it up just to get maybe a little bit more, a uh, little more to the meaning. And this is what I found. In its deeper spiritual meaning, righteousness is the quality of being right in the eyes of God, including character, nature, Conscience, attitude, conduct, action, and command, word. Righteousness is, therefore, based upon God's standard because he is the ultimate lawgiver. So pretty much, pretty much saying the same thing, right? And I like how this brings out and command, word. Because remember, if you, for you to truly keep the law, Outside of the grace of God, you you must be able to keep it in word, thought, and deed. That's God's level of perfection. So when you're righteous by faith, God imputes the righteousness to you. He, he, he gives you the righteousness based on Christ. And what he did at the cross, being the perfect sacrifice for the sins of man. So God, because you need it in all those areas. Some people perhaps were able to control their behavior, but like I've said in many Bible studies, but it was still in their heart. So the righteousness that God provides is thorough. Right? It's a complete righteousness. And that's what we need. It, we, 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 it would have done no good if we were made righteous in some areas and not others. Because the nature of mankind it would come up. That's the, uh, you know, that's just, <laughs> that's just the nature of reality. But God's righteousness is so thorough and so perfectly cleansing that it cleanses us in every area. Isaiah 33, 33 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Remember, what truly matters is what God thinks. The Okay, uh, perhaps I can say it this way. There are a lot of opinions in the world. There's my opinion, there's your opinion, there's media, there's news, you know, there's whatever. But whose opinion truly matters? The Lord. Because he's the ultimate lawgiver. He is the ultimate judge. I may have a particular opinion of you. Uh, 
I may have said particular things about your particular description, but in the end, whose description of you truly matters? God's. It's like Jesus said, uh, don't fear a man who can, they can do things to your body, but God can do things not just only to your body, but to your spirit and your soul. God is the ultimate standard of the universe. So you may break my laws. You may go against my desires. And that has a certain amount of weight. But the one that you truly, the one that should truly matter to you, what he thinks, what he wants, is the Lord. Mankind flip-flops. We're here and there. We're all over the place. But God is steady. God is infinitely perfect. He's infinitely just. And he's the ultimate authority in all the universe. The true God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, the Lord God of all heaven and earth, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. So whose judgment do you truly need to be concerned about? God's judgment. Whose laws? The ultimate lawgiver, God. And who is the ultimate leader of the universe? Who do you want to rule your life? Who do you want to lead and guide you? Who do you want to be your king? The Lord. Earthly kings? Well, we've seen plenty of examples of that, how that goes sometimes and how it doesn't. Earthly kings here, that you know, corruption is probably one of the most common things on every government on this planet at different levels. Yeah, different governments are corrupt at different levels. Some less than others, some way, way more, some way less, but almost every last one of this corruption. Who do you want? Who do who do we want as our king? The perfect, the all-knowing, the all-noble, the infinitely honorable God. He's the best king. See, Christians, and perhaps Jews for that matter, not um, have always believed in a one world order in a sense. It's just that we know it, that cannot be ruled by humans because they're too flawed. They're too corrupt. We've always believed the best form of government is a kingship, but the key is you need the right king. And there's only one right king. That's Jesus. He's the only one that can truly qualify to be. Because when you study the word of God, there were great kings in the kingdom of Israel, but every last one of them had some blemish on some mark on their character or on their story. Yeah. And King David, perhaps arguably one of the best of them, and we know how to what great extent he fell. King Solomon, oh. You talk about my, a man that had it all. And what does the Bible say? And as time passes, many wives turned his heart from God. He began worshiping other gods. You see that? So the best government, the best one world order can only be truly successful and ruled by the best king. And that is Jesus. Anything else will be corrupt and will and will be less. That's why you don't you don't want it until he comes. But we all know uh, the Bible tells how that story is going to go. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
so so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One man, one man's actions threw it all off, and rightly so. So one could argue, well, that's not fair. What's that has to do with me? But think about it. Think about it. You are in the line of your ancestors. That's just the, you know, that's just biology. That's just, as I said, that's just the math of it. Yeah. If your grandfather died before he had your your father or your mother, you wouldn't be here. So it makes sense that the one that everyone else came out of, he threw, he put a kink in the plan. The the road was straight. It was it was um flowing in the right direction. And he put a a, a tragic deviation in. And it makes sense because he's a forefather as well. One man did that. One man justifies and and consider this, which I, I thought about. It was interesting. This is a side note. It was on Adam. Because think about it. The Bible says Eve ate first, nothing happened. But when Adam ate, the whole thing went off. Which possibly, you know, obviously this is way uh, it would take up. I mean, <laughs> the Holy Spirit would actually have to answer this question. But it seems to me that possibly, let's say Adam had said to Eve, no, I'm not doing that. The road would have stayed, the path would have stayed correct. Now, what would have happened to Eve? Uh, what would have been the adventures of? I mean, I mean, I I don't know. Only God probably truly knows that answer. Uh, and I'm sure there are probably some quote unquote extra biblical or um ancient Judaic traditions, maybe, or writings that may try to tackle that, but obviously that's you know, that's neither neither here nor there. But one man, one man threw it off. But here's what's even more amazing, what's more awesome. Through the actions of one man, the God man, he put the road back on the correct path. He straightened the road out. So now, what, what, what is it? You just have to choose to walk on that road. I love how consistent God is. He's very consistent. Well, because he's perfect. When you're perfect, you don't have to make adjustments. He's very consistent. Free will was given. And the Garden of Eden, free will is given now. You, cho you choose. You choose. So God is very consistent. We had free will back then, and the same is true now. So Adam threw it all off. Now, Christ has come, the God-man, the ultimate sacrifice, right? Given the ultimate gift to all mankind, whoever chooses, now you decide. You decide. So one man was disobedient and one man was obedient. One man was disobedient and what was the result? Condemnation, death. One man was obedient. What's the gift that's being offered to you? Life, justification, righteousness, life. And think about this. This is in the scripture. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. I don't know if we often think about that, if we consider that, but the Bible's clear. The law came that the offense might abound. Many, not all, but many focus on the law, keeping the law. We, They believe we should focus, but look at what the Bible is saying. What the law actually does is bring the sin out. It's in you. It was in you. It wasn't you before the law. It's in you now. What does the law do? It brings it out. So now you know you need a savior. You might try to deny it. You might try to hide. 
but now you know you need a savior. It's like an example I, I once uh, a friend of mine gave long ago who said, um, someone is telling you, I can lift this car. You say, no, dude, that's impossible. The weight of an average, the, the average weight of a vehicle, I believe, is 3,500 pounds. You cannot lift a car. Yes, I can. I'm telling no, you can't. No, no, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. You know the best thing to do? Okay, go go lift it up. And you know what could, what he'll come to? Okay, uh, I couldn't lift it up. So when someone says, I can keep the law, I can keep the law. You can't. Yes, I can. I you, no, no, you can't. Yes, I can. Okay, fine, keep it. And mankind had thousands of years to do it. And no one could. Word, thought, and deed. Right? The law actually brings the sin out. But the beauty of it is, hey, where sin abounds, guess what? Grace abound much, abounded much more. Meaning God has more than covered the existence of sin. I like how uh, Pastor Joseph Prince says it. I often quote him. Um, you'll hear me quote him on a number of Bible studies. I actually consider him uh, my pastor along with my local pastor. You know, so I attend, uh, obviously, uh, a place of worship here, but I follow him a lot. Um, so, um, but at any rate, um, I like how Pastor Joseph Prince often says it. Um, When, like, as Pastor Joseph Prince would say it, Christ was an overpayment. He wasn't an exact, he was an overpayment. The sacrifice of God for mankind was an overpayment. Like you owed, you had $300,000 in debt to your creditors, and they're coming to take you and everything you have, put you in jail, and a, and a, and a benefactor comes and pays. For your 300000 pays $100 million. It was an overpayment. That's what the, the, the perfect lamb of God was for the sins of man. He was an overpayment. Proverbs 3 and 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Okay. So the Bible teaches us to be merciful and truth. So, I like how uh, another translation, I chose New King James, but I, another translation, it expands more on those words. So, the Bible's telling you to be merciful, truthful, to be loyal and kind. So much so. The Bible's saying this is such an important thing. Bind it around your neck. Christians should be merciful, truthful, kind and loyal that's care so and no matter how powerful you are and no matter how rich you are right what does the bible teach us you should be merciful you should be truthful honest you should be kind gentle hearted you know uh, giving and you should be loyal 
those are characteristics of a Christian. And once again, we've said this in many Bible studies. How does these grow in your life? You just need to keep seeing more of Jesus. So, and what will be the results? Well, you'll find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge and he shall direct your path. So, when you put your faith in Christ, right? God promises to direct your path. You do not have to be lost or uncertain. You don't have to flounder about. God promises to direct your path. But what does he say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust him. And don't depend on your own. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't depend on the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't depend on your ability to assess your own understanding. Acknowledge God. So pray to him. Pray to him about the little things. Pray to him about the big things. Trust in him. And what does God say? He shall, he'll direct your path. That's one of the benefits of being righteous in Christ. This is one of the results you will get being when you accept righteousness in Christ. You don't have to depend on yourself and how you see things and your assessment. God will guide you. He promises. So that's one of the promises that you get when you are righteous in Christ. Psalms 511, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who also love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as a shield. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, what does God promise? That he'll defend you. He'll protect you. Right. So remember, so what did I say earlier? According to your faith, be it done unto you. Take these scriptures down, write them down. When you get time, when it occurs to you, meditate on them. Recite them to yourself. You don't have to be loud. You don't have to, if you're at work, you don't have to yell and you know, draw attention to yourself. You can say it under your breath. You can put them on cards or 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 in a, you know, just or you, know, you can me memorize them, whatever's good for you. But Recite these, these scriptures. Like we like to say now in our culture, use your words. You say it uh, maybe facetiously, but yes, that's as I use your words. Talk these scriptures out. What am I saying? This is a promise that God gives to the righteous. He will defend you. So you are not alone. It's not just up to you to defend yourself. Now, if you want to depend on yourself, okay, that's on you. But God is saying, I am ready, willing, and wanting to defend you. Trust in me. Trust God. You've put your faith in Jesus. His blood has cleansed you of all your sin. Trust God. God, you will defend me. God, you will defend me. You're on my side. Trust God. You... See, and, and here's a, and, and I've said, you know, previously, um, this also debunks the idea that Christians, the Christian life is a sad, defeated, depressed, woes me life. What does the Bible tell us to do? Tell us to trust in God and do what? Be joyful. Be joyful. This is what the Bible teaches us. When you are righteous, you can be joyful. God promises to defend you. He promises to bless you. 
You are righteous through Jesus, through your faith and trust in him, in his blood and what it's done. Remember what Jesus told Thomas? He says, Thomas, uh, because you've seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. The, the, so we may not physically see the physical Jesus walking the earth, but we can still believe. And what's the result? He will bless you and he will shield you in with his favor. This is what God promises. Take hold of these promises. Recite them to him. Speak them back to God. Whenever you get your, Lord, this is what you said. Father, this is your, I know, Father, you are honorable. Your word never fails. Listen to me. God cannot lie. God will never lie. His word cannot fail. So if God said this is what he will do, he will honor his word. And God said for the righteous, he will defend them and he will put shield them in with his favor. I am expecting and believing God to shield me in with his favor. I am expecting, I am believing God to bless me. Why? Because I am righteous. Jesus' blood, the perfect lamb of God, has cleansed me of all unrighteousness and of all iniquity. There is no sin on me. God sees no sin on me. Now, once again, as Joseph Prince has taught us, there's sin in me, but God doesn't see any sin on me. And the sin in me is being worked out. The more I see Jesus, the more the Holy Spirit transforms me into his image, and the sin in me will continuously decrease. It'll keep going down. And eventually, we'll have a new body, and there'll be no sin in me. But now God promises he sees no sin on me. So what will God do for me? He will defend me. I can be joyful. I can be happy. I can rejoice. Life is a wonderful journey. Why? Because I have God on my side. The favor of God is with me. God will never forsake me. He'll never leave me. He'll never turn his back on me. He'll never be ashamed of me. He'll never be abandoned me. He will never abandon me. That is his promise. So hold God to his word. Psalms 34, 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. That's another promise of God to the righteous. You Christian, you that put your faith and trust in Jesus that receive the gospel, that know his blood has cleansed you of all your sin, God hears your cry. Factions of this world, the dark world, want you to believe that God is too busy, he's too big, that's too small, it doesn't matter to him. He's not listening. You sin. You have sin in you. God doesn't hear you. God, uh, as I once heard a pastor say, and reading this, I disagree with you. He said, God don't care nothing about your belly aching. No, I, I don't agree with that. That promotes the idea that God is this hard, mean, stern, taskmaster God. Like, don't come with that. I, I don't stop all your groveling. Stop all your sniveling. Get it together. Straighten up. And is it no wonder that many don't want to come to him? They don't want to come to our God because look at look at how we promote him. What the Bible says: the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. The righteous cry out, and the Lord delivers them out of some of their trouble. 
out of all their troubles. So now I can lay hold of this promise, this claim. I have to remind myself, no matter what it is God promised, he'll deliver me. He will never forsake me. God promises he will deliver me out of not some of my troubles, all of my troubles. That is the promise of God. I need to lay hold of you. You need to lay hold of that promise. Recite it. Repeat it to yourself. Pray it to God. God, you promise. This is your word, God. You promised. You swore, God. You promised. You are the righteous God of all this earth. I know you will keep your word. You promised, God. You promised to deliver. You promised to defend me. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. I had to pause there. Meditate on that. No weapon formed again. So I must lay hold of this promise. You must lay hold of this promise. God, you promised that no weapon formed against me will prosper. So here's the thing. Will it be formed? Okay. Didn't say it wouldn't be formed. Just say it's not going to work. Didn't say it wouldn't be formed. It's not going to work. It won't prosper. And, all, and the ones that are talking about me, the ones that are slandering me, the ones that are putting false rumors out of me, and once again, I'm, this is not necessarily happening to me. And for the most part, it isn't. But this is the idea of the scripture. Those that are doing that to you, guess what? You shall condemn them. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So don't worry about the people that are slandering you. Ignore them. And why? Why is this available to us? Because we're righteous. Because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Where's the right? Who 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 gives us this righteousness? The Lord. You see that? So, who you decide to serve, what God you say, that's on you. As for me in my house, we shall worship the Lord. There's a lot of different people on TikTok and YouTube, and you know a lot of these anti Christ ideology is being put out there and it was so okay listen you're entitled to your opinion you do you that's on you 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 choose for you i know what i choose for me and what i'm advising everyone to choose for themselves choose the lord choose jesus and what will god do for you right no weapon he will not allow any weapon formed against you to prosper Okay, fine. You don't want to worship God? Okay, you do. You You want to defend yourself? All right. But just to remind you, you live in a fallen world, and there are a lot of weapons out there. There are a lot of dark forces out there. You think you can handle it on your own? God gives you free choice. Okay. But just remember, you chose to fight the battle on your strength and power, on whatever or whatever other thing or object, whatever you claim to be God. Okay, that's on you. But just remember, when you get the results, right, don't whine, don't complain. Hey, just remember, that's the path you chose. As for me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. My God is the Lord. My God is Jesus. I serve one God and three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Oh, I don't believe in that. Okay, you do you. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm depending on. I know who I'm praying to, to manifest himself to me, to strengthen my belief in him, to purge me of unbelief. To purge. I know who my eyes are looking towards. I'm looking towards the Lord. I'm looking towards Jesus. I advise you to do the same. But that's on you. 
Matthew 7, 7. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking, it will be open. I, I pulled this out of the Amplified ver Version because I like how it expands. Because apparently in the Greek, the tenses are such that what it is actually saying, and I, if I'm, it's not a perfect tense. So it's not final. It's saying, ask and keep on asking. Right? And it will be given to you. That's the promise to the righteous. Keep on asking. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Keep on seeking. You're seeking, you're asking and seeking and knocking based on your belief in Christ. Based on, you are not alone. So the Bible tells you, keep, don't give up. And some realities, the answers come quick. And some, the answers take a long time. We get that. But however the path is, don't give up. God, you said in your word, if I keep on asking you, you will give it to me. It will be given. I'm asking God if I'm seeking. So remember, so this is part of your lifestyle. The, but this is a promise to the righteous. So you asking, asking God, well, uh, yeah, you ain't, you're not getting nothing. Is that the idea? No, I, no, it's the exact opposite. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. This is the promise to the righteous. You, It will be given to you. You will find. It's definite. The door will be open to you. Definite. Definite. In like manner, Matthew 7, verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will instead give him a stone? Or if, his, or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? If you then evil, sinful by nature, as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more? Will your father who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking him? Amplified version. I, it, I love how it brings it out. Your God is perfect. Think about what this is saying. And this is Jesus speaking. In their face, he said it to them. Look, you being evil. You being the way you know your nature. You know the, the, the secret thoughts you have and the, the things you do in public and the things you don't do and no one is, the things you do do and no one is looking. You know you, you being evil, give good gifts to your children. How much more your father who's in heaven, who is perfect, he's infinitely good, infinitely honorable. So God, the Bible says God is love. Think about that. How much more God the Father? So what does the Bible say? Keep on asking. So you're asking with the attitude of, Father, I know you hear me, and you will answer me. You're not in heaven somewhere ignoring me, disregarding me. You're, you're working. You're Commanding the angels, moving galaxies, you know, managing dark holes and white dwarfs. You know, you're busy and I'm over here pleading and begging, which you shouldn't do anyway. Because remember, you're not a slave. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit grafts you into the family of God. You're not a slave. You're a son or a daughter of God. I'm a son of God because of my faith in Jesus. So I so and it, so I must not approach God 
with the attitude of a slave. Oh, please, oh God, I know you're so busy. I know you're busy, Lord. Please, God, if you could just maybe take... No, that's not the attitude of the Christian. That's not what the Bible is telling us. Ask and keep on asking. Why? Because he's our father. So this is you going to your father. He's not like a lot of earthly fathers, mean and nasty and traumatized and, and uncaring, you know, works all day, comes home, eats, goes to the room, you know, or like I had one friend of mine long ago, he said, hey, when, when his father would come home, everybody would go to their room and shut the door. Oh, daddy's home. It wasn't, daddy's home. Happy and joyful. It was like, oh, dad's home. And everybody would just go to their place in the house and just stay out of his way. They would just avoid him. So they don't get on his nerve. They don't snap at them. Well, that's not God, your father in heaven. God is love. And he's telling us. So this is for me, too. He's telling us, come to me, pray. This is for me also. And I have to remind myself of that. I have to remind myself of that. And I have to recite these scriptures, meditate on them. God is my father. I'm his son. Ask and keep on asking. He will give. What, so what are we talking about? Promises based on righteousness. He will give. Okay, so let's bring balance to this. Am I saying, or is the Bible saying, God, our Father, is like a genie in a bottle, and you rub it, and he can... No, that's not what it's saying. The Bible is... I, I hold the Bible in, in great regard. Many don't, but I do. And the Bible is actually very well balanced. So the scripture which says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But it actually has a dual meaning. It means he'll put the desires in your heart and then give you the, those desires. See how balanced that is? When you delight yourself in him. So the idea isn't, God, you're my great butler. You know, you're a genie in a bottle. Coincidentally, I didn't know this. I'm coming to know it now. The concepts of genies, like you see in the movies, the genie in the bottle, many of the movies you see portray the genie as benevolent and good. Actually, if I'm correct, it comes out of Arabian culture and theology, and they were actually evil. I haven't studied this a lot, but I have a, a slight understanding of it, that genies, according to Arabian culture and theology, were evil. They were tricksters. And I don't know, like, I've never studied, you know, maybe there were some that were good, maybe, I mean, I don't, but so, so no, God's not a genie. And the idea isn't here, God, you're here to give me whatever I want. No. You're my father. I'm continuously seeing more of Jesus. I'm delighting in you. I'm trusting in you. So those things in my heart that I desire, that you know, Holy Spirit, oh, that's not, that's not good. That's not it. You're doing what? You're removing them. And then you're putting in me your desires and then fulfilling them. Which if you think about it, when you think about it, is a, a, a source of true happiness. Happiness. What does the Bible say? It says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Okay? I'm, <laughs> I'm zooming back up. Okay. We're still talking on this, okay? We're still talking on this. This is the time, right? Hope, the Bible teaches hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when that thing comes, it's a, it brings a spring of joy, if I'm quoting it correctly. 
See, what you want to do, or what I, I advise you to do, is pray this prayer regularly. Ask God to either bring your desires below your life or bring your life above your desires. That's a source of happiness. What do I mean? If you have a job and you're walking to work, let's say it's two miles, and you have a desire for a car to drive to work, that's your desire. And I come and I give you a bicycle. Will you be happy? Yeah, probably. But not quite. If you're hoping and believing for a car and you're blessed with a bicycle, you'll ride it. If, and if you're a grateful person, and you should be, you'll be grateful. But that's not quite the desire of your heart. If you're blessed with a car, you'll experience uh, happiness. You'll experience a joy in that moment, right? And every time, oh man, you know, I can drive to work now. But if you want a car, but your mind is, I want a Mercedes. I want a Mercedes. God bless me with a Mercedes. I want a Mercedes. I want a Mercedes. And then I come and give you a Toyota, great car. You should be grateful. You should be happy. But you might be, which is, we see this, this is often the case, disappointed. You see, I hope my example is bringing it out. So the issue with many people is they have runaway desires. That's why they're always unhappy. They're always ungrateful. We've all seen those TikToks or those little videos where dad comes home, gives his son, I saw one, gave him a pickup truck. Hey, it wasn't brand new. It was a used pickup truck. Hey, I looked at it and said, man, you could paint it, you know, put some wheels on it. You could make that. And he was what is this? This was his reaction. Are you kidding? He got really upset, got angry. I don't want this. This is what, you, and the, you know, the father and the are standing like, son, we'll give you, oh, um, and he's disappointed. He's upset. And then he said, oh, so this is the car. So this is my car now? I said, yes, yeah, son. And then he went in the house and, and got a baseball bat and was going to start striking the car. They stopped him. Well, that's, that's ungrateful. See, when you have runaway desires, it's hard for you to be happy. He should have been grateful. So what you want the Holy Spirit to do, and he will do, he'll help you, is to bring your desires under his control to where you can be at peace and happy and satisfied wherever you are. There's some people, they're happy with whatever meal they eat. There's some people, if it isn't filet mignon and French wine from the early 20th century, what is this? All right? That's all, in, that's, it's in our minds. So pray. Ask the God, ask, ask the Holy Spirit to either bring your desires down or bring your life up. There's a quote, um, and I don't remember who originally said it, but it basically goes like this. Happy or blessed is the man who doesn't get everything he wants, but wants less. That's the basic idea of it. Happy is the man, not just getting all his desires, but desires less. And that's what you, the Holy Spirit, he's been helping me. He'll help you. He'll help bring your desires in, under control. All right. 
So, you know, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I'm walking to work. I want a car. I want a car. I want a car. And you get a car. Oh, thank you, God. So great. Two, three months later. Oh, man. Car's okay. It's cool. But I want, I want, I want a Mercedes. I want a two-door sport BMW. Look at all these two-door sport BMWs. I want, I want, I want. And then you grind and you work and you get the two-door sport BMW and you, you're elated. I did it. All right. Two, three months later. Eh. A year later, eh, fades away. Now you, I want, I want, I want. <laughs> you know, it like it never ends. It just, you know, it never ends. It's an area of our life that the Holy Spirit can help us. Okay, that's kind of we're still talking about promises based on righteousness. A little bit of a side note. So pray that Holy Spirit help the Holy Spirit. He'll bring your either bring your life above your desires. Or bring your desires beneath your life. And I and I agree. Like I can't remember who, who originally said it. Um, but yes, happy is the man who desires less. Right? Philippians 4 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This is Philippians. This is a new living translation. So, Old Testament, what was the thinking? When you come before God, don't, don't talk a lot. That's what the Old Testament taught us. Be a, be a few words. God is righteous. Don't talk a lot. New Testament comes and it changes. So remember this principle, this concept. We've often said that what the the Old Testament is a New Testament concealed. The New Testament is Old Testament revealed. There are some things. So the New Testament, there's something that the New Testament affirms from the Old Testament. There are some things that the New Testament modifies. It changes a little from the Old Testament. And then there are some things that the New Testament removes from the Old Testament. Remember that. And this is one of those things. Old Testament, when you come before God, don't talk a lot. Don't be one of much words. What does the New Testament tell us? No. You, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, his blood has washed up all your sins. All, you've been justified by Christ. Don't worry about anything. Was that saying to me? Don't be afraid of anything. Instead, pray about everything. Pray about the little things. Pray about the big things. I like how Joseph Prince says it. If it's important to you, it's important to God. Remember that. That's one of the promises that God has. So now, instead of me, and I have to remind myself, instead of being of panicking, getting scared when something arises, you know, uncertain, what do I do? Don't be afraid. Relax. Calm down. Calm down. Relax. Pray. Pray. Little things, big things. Quick testimony. This happened a few months ago. The alternator, on, well, I didn't realize it at the time. I'm working. I finish one delivery. I'm about to make another. And my car starts jumping. Boom, boom. Well, right? And I thought I could make it. And I looked up. The way it was acting as it could, well, the battery light came on on the dashboard. So I'm thinking, oh, something's wrong with the battery. So I looked up real quick where there was a auto zone. And I was trying to make it there. Car cut off. Right on a two-lane road, I'm blocking one lane. Two-lane road going both ways. I'm blocking one lane. Car stops dead in the water. Oh, and I'm out in the suburbs. Of, I, when it first happened, oh, what? all right, calm down. So I just, I calmed down. And you know what I did? I started praying. 
I said, oh, hello, spirit. I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? The cars are behind me. Some of them honking their horns. Some of them going around me. I'm like, oh, man, the car stopped. I'm trying to, okay, Lord, what do I do, God? I need your help. I don't know what to do. I don't have AAA, you know. I don't, you know. Uh, I'm just, uh, I, and I just started, and I would say, probably in about five minutes. I'm not exaggerating. I'm sitting there praying, Lord, help me. I need your help, God. I need your help. The, the truck's up. I don't, I don't know what to do. Five minutes later, I'm not exaggerating. A tow truck. Pulls around me, pulls ahead of me and parks. I get out. My vehicle, he gets out. And he said, hey, man, what's going on? He said, yeah, I passed by you. I saw you were stuck here. Well, you know, what you trying to do? I said, oh, man, I'm, I was trying to make it to that auto, to an auto zone. He said, where is it? He says, yeah, I mean, I, I can get you there if you want. How much? We discussed the price. I cashed at them. He loaded my truck onto his tow truck, drove me in the truck to the auto zone, and I bought a new battery. Um, then it wasn't the battery alternator. Eventually, we discovered that I needed a new alternator, and I was able to get that repaired. But, yeah, that's the idea. I'm sitting stuck in the middle of the street like, oh, man, there, there's a line of cars behind me. I'm trying to figure out, oh, man, what do I do? I pray. God help me. I don't know what to do. Uh, who do I, you know, I don't, I don't know. What I'm, and just like that, he loaded up and, you know, and so don't worry about anything. And I know that's sometimes easy to say. I realize that. But meditate on these scriptures. Think about them throughout the day. Maybe text them to yourself or create a file on your phone. Where you can. You know, leave notes to yourself. You know, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Be grateful. Thank God. You're alive. You're here. Life is a wonderful, beautiful journey. Be grateful. You're eating regularly. Some of you, and well, perhaps me, are eating more than regularly. You have food, you have shelter. You know, you're healthy. You can walk, you can run. Be grateful. Make it a habit of thanking God. Because trust me when I tell you, there are some people out there that have it so much worse than you. And I mean so much worse. When I look at some of the things that people that uh, happening to people around this world, I realize I don't really have problems. I have irritations. Yeah. I need to repair my gutter. I want to finish my basement. I mean, yeah, it annoys me. It's that's an irritation. There are people stuck in the middle of wars. There are people being brutalized. Certain countries or cultures collapsing, being overrun by gangs and violence, wickedness. I realize, you know what? <laughs> Truthfully, my life is gravy. Now, fine. Yes. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, you got a busted gutter, you should fix it. I mean, you know, but I realize. I have irritations, God. And I'm so be grateful. Think, try to find as many things to thank God for every day. Don't make it a law. I'm not saying create a law in your heart, right? Because we know what the law does. It brings out. But consider that. Keep that in mind. Try to find as much as you can to thank God for and to be thankful for. What are the promises based on righteousness? Peace. Peace. Do this. 
Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Talk to him and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. The older I get and the more I have grown, it is just mind-blowing to me how valuable peace is. I didn't see it in my 20s. I didn't see it when I was younger, but boy, do I see it now. Peace is priceless. I repeat, peace is priceless. And there are many people, and this was me at one time, you know why they can't see the value of peace? <laughs> because they never experienced it. And their minds are unenlightened. They don't re realize that under all that chaos, of their life is something precious and golden, but they don't realize it. And as some people, we get older and then we realize, man, peace. It is wonderful to have peace. It is wonderful to be at peace. Praise God. And the, as you grow and you mature, you're going to value peace more and eliminate people that are not peaceful from your life. The older I get, and I'm saying this to you, it's going to the the more you you see how wonderful peace is. When you see the periods. The, the excuse me, the spirit of non-peace on someone, you can sense it coming. You can sense it in them. And you go, nope, no, not doing that. Say, no, nope, 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 I'll pass. Nope. Peace is priceless. And what a wonderful gift of God. So remember the scripture. Go back real quick. Just think, just think of it this way. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So don't be worry about it. Pray about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. What did we learn prior in the prior scriptures? Ask and keep on asking and you shall receive. All right? Then, so when you do this, what is the promise to the righteous? You will experience God. Now, the government's peace may be one thing. A lot of reticent peace may be one thing, your peace, family peace, but man, you will experience God's peace. And, and look how the Bible puts it out there, which exceeds anything we can understand. Meditate on that. Meditate on that. God's peace exceeds anything. We can understand. Outstanding. His peace, which exceeds anything you understand. What will it do? Guard your hearts and minds as you live in what? Christ Jesus. Your hearts and your mind will be guarded. Mental illness, in my opinion, but a little bit I see, it seems like it's at epidemic proportions. And I believe the numbers verify this. There are so many people suffering from various forms and various levels of mental illness. So many people on some type of drug or medication for mental, some form, some type, some level of mental illness. It seems like it's that epidemic. Report. I believe, if I'm correct, once again, I haven't verified this, I believe this to be true, that there are more people now on some type of drug for some form of mental illness than there have ever been ever in man's history. I believe that to be true. But what, what will God's peace give you? It will guard your hearts and mind. 
You know how the Bible tells to guard your heart? It will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. So let's summarize. We talked about righteousness as the quality of being right in the eyes of God. You want to be right in the eyes. It's cool if you're right in my eyes. Hey, that's cool. I'll accept it. <laughs> you know. But what's really important, what really matters, the king, the president, the government, righteousness is the quality of being right in God, in the eyes of God, God's eyes. The Lord is of infinite value to our lives. Make God your number one priority, your all in all, your everything. Who better to dedicate your most valuable gift, your life to, than the Lord? Sin, judgment, and death all came into existence because of the actions of one man, Adam. Don't hate him. He made a mistake. But the Bible says, honor your father and mother. Your days will be long on the earth. So whether we like it or not, he is our forefather. Don't hate him. He made a mistake. But here's the beauty of it. God's gift of righteousness came into existence because also because of the actions of the one, Jesus Christ. See that? Neo is not the one. Many of you know what that means. Jesus Christ is the one. One man messed it up, one man fixed it. The Bible admonishes us to be merciful, kind, truthful, and loyal. When I read this initially, it just hit my heart. Yes, I want to be powerful. Yes, I want to be strong. Yes, I want to have financial resources. I want to be a man of excellence, of might, you know. But with all of that, I need to be merciful. I need to be kind. I need to be truthful and loyal. Be loyal. Be loyal. Be there for the ones you say you'll be there for. Be true to your friends. Be committed to them. Support them. Loyalty. Don't turn your back on them when it's convenient for you or when the, you know, the tides are right. Told you. Be loyal. Be the kind of person that your friends know. If there's one person I can depend on, I can depend on him. I got a number of people in my circle, but him, I can rely on him. If anything goes down, I know he'll, he's got my back. All right? So while we're out here trying to grind, and try to be masters, you know, of our destiny and be powerful and, you know, be a boss. Okay. But with all of that, be merciful, be kind, truthful, and loyal. When you are in Christ, acknowledge God in all your ways. He promises to direct your path. You do not have to be lost. You don't have, Remember that you don't have to be in a state of confusion. If that arises, pray. You're a Christian. You put your, your faith in Christ. Pray. When things start to shift and you don't know what's going on, your 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 reaction, pray. When you are in Christ, God promises so, to defend you. Remember that. Hold God to his word. God, you promised to defend me. Who better to defend you, God or you? Who do you think will do a better job? He promises to defend you. When you are in Christ, God promises to bless you. Hold God to his word. God. Father, you promised that you would bless me. You promised, Father God, that you would bless me. When you are in Christ, God's favor surrounds you like a shield. Your favorite. When you leave the house, when you come home, keep that in mind. I am favored by God. God cannot lie. You can depend on him. You can depend on his word. If he said it, he'll do it. Hold God to his word. When you are in Christ, God hears your cries. You matter to God. Don't listen to the voices, the forces, the denominations that tell you. Stop all that belly aching. 
things that you think God got time for all that? Stop all that whining and so you know? No. He hears your cries. You have a loving father. He hears your cry. Commune with God. When you are in Christ, God delivers you out of all your troubles. Not some. All. Not some. You, God, no matter what it is, know this. God will deliver you out of all your troubles. This is the promise to the righteous. This is what you get when you are in Christ. When you are in Christ, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Keep that in mind. It might form, but it won't it won't prosper. So don't walk in fear. Don't walk in defeat. God's got your back. When you are in Christ, you are you when you are in Christ and you ask and keep on asking, it will be given to you. When you are in Christ and you seek and keep on Seeking, you will find. When you are in Christ, if you knock and keep on knocking, the door will be open. Christian, don't give up. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. God, Hold God to his word. This is Jesus speaking. Hold him to his word. Lord, you said this would be the case. This is what you said, God. Hold God to his word. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. When you are in Christ, God does not want you afraid of anything. Keep that in mind. You do not have to be afraid of anything. I regularly pray and ask God to purge me of all fear and of all anxiety. And I'm seeing the results. You don't have to be afraid of anything. It doesn't matter what it is. When you are in Christ, you are free to pray about everything. Be feel free. So, in other words, don't spend time um, what's the word, editing your speech to God. I got to make sure I say it the right way. I got to just pray and keep on praying. Pray and keep on praying. If it matters to you, it matters to God. You, you can feel free to now watch. Listen to this. That's not necessarily true about people. No, people, there are some things you, you don't want to tell certain people. And sometimes you know who they are and you often sometimes you don't. No, there's certain things I've had now, you know, obviously there's some beyond my, I, you know, I've, I've and I, I, you know, not true. I've had even uh, married couples say, husbands say, no, they're, there are certain things you don't tell your wife. Let's say I don't tell my wife certain things. And I don't think they're being deceptive, but like, you know, they're saying, you know, because I know how it might affect her. So, you know, I might. So in other words, <laughs> okay, perhaps I shouldn't have stepped out onto this little piece of road, but maybe they're saying, you know, just... Be conscious of how you say it to her or when you say it to her, because it could affect her adversely, you know, you know, so. And and once again, I'm not this is what I've had married couples tell me. I'm not necessarily saying the Bible says that, but I'll just bring out the point. But with God, you can pray about everything. God, you can tell anything. Not always such a good idea for all people. And finally, when you are in Christ, you are grateful. Be grateful. Be grateful. Make it a habit of thanking God. Don't make it a law. So I'm not promoting that because we know the results of that. But consider this. I'm just putting this seed out there and may the Holy Spirit plant it in your heart and, and cause it to germinate and bring forth a good harvest. Be grateful. Find as much as you can to thank God for. And trust me, there's a lot. You have so much to be, be to be thankful for. So much. But sometimes we just can't see it because our minds are bogged down with so many other things. Be grateful. Thank God. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day. 
Thank you, Lord, for the rain and for feeding the plants and the grass. Thank you, God, that I can walk, I can, I can talk, I can run. There are people out there that can walk but can't run and wish they could run, right? There are people out there that can run but can't run fast, you know, but, you know, um, thank you, God. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my wife, for my children. Thank you, Father, for my son. You bless me with a beautiful son, beautiful daughter, you know, even when they're getting on your nerves. You know, perhaps after you've left and you're on your way, thank you, God, for my son. Touch his heart, Lord. Thank you for my beautiful wife. Thank you that you have just given me somebody to walk this awesome journey with. Thank you, Lord, for this truck. Thank you for my house. Thank There's so much to be thankful for. Thank you, God, that I'm alive. Thank you, God, for giving me a home that I go to regularly. With air conditioning. And hey, Full disclosure. Well, maybe I shouldn't fully disclose this. <laughs> okay. I already said it now, so I guess it's too. But some of my, in my house, in some of the rooms, I have window units. Hey, God, thank you for the window units. I mean, um, hey, I shut that door. I turn that thing on during the summer. And you Room feels like a a nice, moderate refrigerator. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the window units. I will eventually purchase a central air unit. Mine was unfortunately um, ripped out of the house while it was dormant. This house was dormant for a couple of years, and people were going around stealing copper, you know, but Anyway, but thank hey, thank you, God, for the window units. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your provision, for food, for shelter. Thank you for my friends. Thank you, Lord, for my church. Thank you, God, for my parents. All right, maybe you didn't have a good relationship. Fine, but they brought you here, right? You're here. You exist. Thank you, God, for my father and my mother. Thank you. There's so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful. There's only one God in all this universe. As for me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. There is only one true God. There has ever been, ever will be, and there is only one God, only. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord God of all heaven and of all earth. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the wonderful Savior of all mankind. God bless you.